Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Ray from the Bloomfield Public Library. Thank you for joining us tonight for this local author event with Beth Gibbs, author of Soul Food. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Beth. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to start by just kind of giving everybody a brief description of the book and why I wrote it. Because uh, pretty much everything I write focuses on the theme of self-awareness, which leads to clarity, contentment, and resilience in a complicated world. So Soul Food is a collection of loosely connected life-affirming stories celebrating that theme. And the stories start in the mid-1800s and conclude around the late 1900s, because I just kind of like to give a little bit of history in there. So in general, you can read the stories in any order, because if you have the book, because each story stands on its own. Or you can choose to read them from first to last, and then discover connections between many of the characters, their friends, their struggles, and their relationships with each other. So tonight we're gonna to examine a few of those connections. And we're gonna start with the first story. Um, I've edited them down to the bare minimum so you can get the flavor of the characters and their situation, and in many cases, how they're connected. <clears throat> so my first story is titled, A Recipe for Freedom. And the story is about two independent women, one black and enslaved, and one white woman from a wealthy family who is essentially for all intents and purposes, her mistress. Both of them are caught in the economic, social, and cultural prejudices that existed in the 19th century Baltimore, Maryland. But in spite of their differences, the two women find a way to help each other gain freedom, independence, and self-determination. <clears throat> and there's a recipe in the story that is typical of wedding cakes from the 1800s. It looked really delicious, but I'm not a baker. <laughs> <clears throat> the knock at the door sounded firm and determined. 30 years of silence were about to end. Rebecca took the flour tin from the cabinet, placed it next to the other ingredients on the kitchen table, straightened her shoulders, arranged her full lips into a welcoming smile, and opened the door. Charles Bernard, a reporter from the Baltimore Sun, stepped into the kitchen, tipped his hat, and said, Miss Rebecca, I cannot thank you enough for finally agreeing to meet with me after all these years. Rebecca offered Charles a cup of tea and a seat at the table. He sat down and said, May I ask what happened to change your mind? She handed him the letter. His eyes skimmed it quickly, locked on the signature, and shot back up to meet hers. So, he's alive. She's alive. I always thought so. Finally, we can know how and why. Then, here Rebecca explains that she was a companion <clears throat> and servant to Miss Margaret, whose father was arranging a marriage between her and a Mr. Tobias, uh, a worker at his uh, shipbuilding business. And Margaret did not want to do this, but she had a social standing to uphold for her family. And it would have been unheard of her to work, so she had no choice. And in Rebecca's words, <clears throat> it seemed to me in a real way, in spite of her family's wealth and social standing, she didn't have much more freedom than me. Maybe nobody owned her like they owned me, but it didn't make a whole lot of difference in the end. So the marriage took place and no surprise, it wasn't a happy one. He was abusive both to Margaret and to Rebecca. So the two women began to plot ways to help each other get free. So first, Margaret convinces her husband to make a deal with the owner of the local tavern for Rebecca to work there as a cook to buy her freedom. And the only reason that Margaret's husband agreed, and this is true, there was a law at the time that said slave owners had to take care of their enslaved when they got sick or old. But once an enslaved person was freed, that obligation went away. So that's why he agreed. So Rebecca was a brilliant cook, the tavern flourished, and soon Rebecca was a free woman. Then it was her turn to help Margaret. Here's what they did. We set our sights on making a cookbook, and the first problem was money. We needed some. Everything Miss Margaret had was Mr. Tobias's once they got married. She couldn't ask him or her family without rousing suspicion. 
Everything I had was to care for myself and pay back Mr. Edwards. But it was clear to me that I was going to have to trust in God and use some of my savings to help Miss Margaret get free since she helped me get free. Now, I couldn't read nor write back then, and Miss Margaret couldn't cook a lick. But between the two of us, we got it done. We called it the art of nutmeg cookery, and inside was every recipe using nutmeg known to man. And thank heaven, our cookbook flew out the hands of the booksellers like hot Johnny cakes. Then, <clears throat> one night, while Mr. Tobias was out, I helped Miss Margaret pack her bags, got her to the Baltimore station, and put her on the Underground Railroad. So the destination was Canada because Rebecca had a sister there who had escaped from a Virginia plantation and Rebecca knew that her sister would help Margaret get settled. Then Rebecca covered their tracks by dropping a pair of Margaret's shoes, a petticoat and a dress by the river to fake suicide by drowning. So she tells the reporter, Miss Margaret wanted to wait till both her parents were dead before setting the record straight. So when I got her letter, I remembered it was you covered the story. I figured you'd want the truth be told so the case could be closed once and for all. She made a new life for herself there. I made mine here. I guess you could say that me and Miss Margaret made up our own recipe for freedom. Now, just a couple of notes on that <clears throat> story that start, sets the whole book out. I said it in Baltimore, Maryland. But many of the ideas came from the history of slavery in the town I live in, Windsor, Connecticut. And according to the work of a local, my local friend, Marsha Hinckley, she writes in a paper she wrote, most people do not realize that the history of Blacks in Windsor, first recorded in 1680, is nearly as long and old as the town itself. So one other little thing I'd like to <clears throat> point out is that some of you might wonder why Rebecca put Margaret on the Underground Railroad instead of putting her on the train or a boat. And there are a couple of reasons why. Margaret could not have left by herself on a boat or a train as a woman traveling alone. It would cause too much attention. Word would get back to her husband. Big trouble. And the second reason um, that they couldn't leave that way, Rebecca could not go with her as a servant. I mean, in that case, Margaret wouldn't be traveling alone. But in those days, no Black person could enter or leave Baltimore without showing their papers. And that was legal. So that's the reason she put Margaret on the Underground Railroad. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing, because generally we think of the Underground Railroad as a way that enslaved Blacks escaped the South. Hadn't really heard of any uh, white folks being put on the Underground Railroad to escape. So just like that little bit of twist in there, okay? So now, <clears throat> a few decades later, one of Rebecca's descendants takes uh, her place as the main character in the next story. And um, the recipe book that was mentioned in Recipe for Freedom is also gonna show up in this story. So a descendant and the cookbook are the connections for this next story, which is titled, a grave situation. The whole tone has changed here because there are many folk tales from the land of Africa that feature a trickster named Nazi the spider. In Japan, the trickster is Kitsune, the trickster fox. And among the indigenous Navajo in our West, the trickster is Coyote, the hero trickster. Many of you have heard the stories of Br'er Rabbit, who's a central trickster figure in both African-American and Caribbean folktales, who uses his wits to challenge authority figures and get out of difficult situations. So in this story, our modern day trickster is Lucille Jenkins. Remember, she is a descendant of Rebecca, whom we met in the last story. <clears throat> Lucille Jenkins was a woman of substance much of it coming from loving and outliving three husbands with good insurance policies, Frank Washington, Norman Pattyfoot, and most recently, Samuel Lenworth Jenkins. The bitters killed Sam. He was deeply, quietly angry and righteously bitter 
toward a world refusing to look beneath his leathery black surface and respect his manhood. The bitterness festered in his gut for 52 years and finding no way out, finally shot up his spine, smacked him in the head, exploded his brain, and contorted his face into a, his face into a death mask terrible to see. The doctor called it a cerebrovascular accident. The nurse told Lucille it was a stroke, but Lucille knew it was the bitters, and he'd been dead and buried for two months, and she hadn't paid the undertaker for the funeral because she was furious about the way Homer Wilson laid Sam out for the wake. Now, Homer and Lucille lived in a small, close-knit, rural Southern community where privacy was as rare as hen's teeth. So it wasn't long <clears throat> before the dispute between them went public, and everybody watched with interest as Lucille and Homer squared off and began recruiting sides. Lucille invited Pearl Smoot over to set a spell. She served Pearl a slice of her nutmeg glazed gingerbread from the art of nutmeg cookery. Made him up to look like some pious jack laid preacher, Pearl. You saw how much powder and paint Homer put on him. Had his mouth pulled up in some apple-cheeked half-moon smile, the likes of which never crossed his lips in life. And here come Homer telling me the nature of Sam's demise left him no choice. Pish tosh my Aunt Minnie. And to make matters worse, it were too late to do anything about it because folks was coming in to pay their respects. I had to swallow the fit I had ready for Homer and do the right thing. But pay him for ruining the way I last saw my Sam? I think not. And Lucille knew that her story would be all over town before morning. Meanwhile, <clears throat> Homer held court at the barbershop. His audience was the weekly throng gathered to get right for Saturday night at Big Jack's Honky Tonk or Sunday morning services at Mount Moriah Baptist Church, depending upon each man's inclination, interest, and intention. Hmm, I'll take her to court if I have to, Homer sputtered, messing with me. She need a good come uppance. Now, Lucille knew Homer would not take her to court. White Southern justice being what it was in the 1920s, <clears throat> Black folk in Spotsylvania, Virginia, took care of minor disputes among themselves. Lucille intended to outfox, outweight, and outwit Homer. Homer intended to get his money by any means necessary and do his best to save face in the bargain. So in the next part of the story, Homer sends his brother Ernest to collect the money, but that plan fails because Lucille feeds him her best fried chicken and biscuits and fresh baked apple pie. And she'd tell him the money would be along in a few days. And because Ernest's stomach was on the receiving end of Lucille's cooking, he was only too happy to play messenger between Lucille and his brother. So finally, Homer realizes he's going to have to face Lucille himself. <clears throat> he arrived at her front gate one Sunday with his hat in his hand, a thin veneer of respect in his voice and cunning in his eyes. From her parlor window, Lucille watched him open the front gate and slither in. Like a bolt of greased lightning, she shot into position on the top step of her front porch so he'd have to look up at her from the walk. Homer conceded that point with a nod of his head, fixed his eyes on hers, and began the skirmish. Afternoon, Miss Jenkins. How are you? Why, just fine, Mr. Wilson. Just fine, considering my widderhood and how heavy it's weighing on my heart, what with Sam gone. You know how hard it can be for a widow woman. Yes, ma'am, I do. And it pains me mightily to come see you about such a worldly matter when I know your mind is on your late husband and his sojourn in heaven. Well, that's mighty nice of you to say so, Mr. Wilson. Lucille stepped to the edge of the top step and folded her ample arms over her ample belly. Homer knew there'd be no offer of fried chicken or apple pie. 
I only have a minute, Ms. Jenkins, but I felt it necessary to discuss payment for Mr. Jenkins' funeral. I know you weren't happy about the way we laid him out, but the bill must be paid. Now, I'm not greedy. I'm a businessman, and I'm here to make a business proposition. There was a long pause. Lucille waited. Then Homer said, with a straight face, <clears throat> we're going to dig Sam up. Lucille didn't bat an eyelash. Homer moved in for the kill. See, now, the casket is ours, so we're willing to take it back. And three months really ain't such a long time, so it'll have some resale value. But Sam, he's another matter. And since he belongs to you, we'll bring him back and set him up on your front porch. Homer's solemn face hid the giggle bubbling up behind his eyes. Lucille feigned shock. Her right hand covered her heart and her eyes beseeched heaven. Mr. Wilson, I know you've got to do what you've got to do, but you can't put Sam on the front porch. Why, that's downright unchristian. What will my neighbors think? Homer shrugged. It's strictly business, Miss Jenkins. Strictly business, nothing personal. I know you understand. Lucille's eyes narrowed. She leaned forward and lowered her voice. Oh, I understand perfectly. So tell you what, Homer, you go right ahead and dig Sam up, but have your men take him round back and prop him up next to the garage because my boys will be home this weekend. We'll figure out what to do with him then. Homer's mouth dropped open. He was finished. He turned and marched down the walk, slamming the gate behind him. Lucille shot a good day, Homer, after his retreating back and hummed my sweet Lord all the way back to the kitchen. Lucille never delivered payment and Homer never delivered Sam. So that's how that story ended. Um, <clears throat> so the next one is guess who's coming to dinner. And in this story, we learn that every family has its share of dysfunctional members but sometimes we're one of the dysfunctional ones and don't realize it. And in this story, we meet Clay, who's one of Lucille Jenkins' sons. And he has a much bigger role in a couple of stories further on down and definitely in the last story of the book. <clears throat> Guess who's coming to dinner? I am not a happy camper. This is the first time I'll be alone with my family for a holiday since Clay and I got married. Here you go, hon, Clay says. Pick you up at six, okay? Then we'll go home and lick each other's wounds. His eyebrows draw together and wriggle up and down. It's the lust look. It never works because he looks too much like the Qantas Airlines koala bear. Clay gives me a wink. I close the door and I watch him drive off. Growing up in a small New England factory town has its charms, friendly neighbors, a slow leisurely pace, and no need to lock doors. It also has its demons, and I'm about to have Thanksgiving dinner with several of them. I wander into the dining room table to check. Handmade place cards grace each setting, and all our names are there except for two. Dad died 10 years ago, and Tamisha, my eight-year-old niece, died of a rare blood disease a year later. Tony, my pseudo-intellectual Peter Pan brother, married and divorced three times, is always peddling schemes that depend on money, time, and effort from everyone but him. And when they fail, it's anybody's fault but his. Junior, Tony's 14-year-old son, is on his right. Sandy, a musician, is Junior and Tamisha's mother. Tamisha's death put Thandy over the edge. She's in a psychiatric hospital now because three months after Tanisha's, Tamisha's funeral, the police found her wandering stark naked down Main Street, playing God Bless the Child on her saxophone and proclaiming the second coming of Billie Holiday. Tony had no choice. Now, Adrian, my younger sister, lives her life as an empty journal waiting for an entry. And the man she married wrote his life story all over her. 
And on mom's right is an extra setting with no place card. Hmm? Back in the kitchen, mom samples the greens, smacks her lips, and looks at us with a twinkle in her eyes and says, guess who's coming to dinner? Intruder alert. Thanksgiving dinners at our house are traditionally limited to spouses and children. Spouses, not being blood relatives, are tolerated as social necessities. Dates, lovers, and friends are actively discouraged or received with frosty politeness. So who could have wormed their way into mom's good graces? It's Merle Fontaine of the Philadelphia Fontaines. It's mom's first cousin. And Merle doesn't walk into a room. She sweeps in. And with a swift motion of one manicured hand, her mink coat leaves her shoulders, traces a graceful arc through the air, and lands on the stool next to Adrian. Her hair is swept up into a classic ponytail, and the sparkle of her expensive jewelry pales before the 24-carat joy in her eyes. A few minutes later, dinner's ready. Merle's face is animated. <clears throat> her hands fly through the air, and she tosses her words in our direction. Now, darling, she says, tell me what you've been up to. I'm dying to hear. Well, by the time Merle asks me about my life, the usual family drama and conflict is non-existent. There are no interruptions, no unsolicited advice, no bickering. How is this happening? Why is it happening? And most of all, why can't it happen when it's just us? With my mouth full of stuffing and gravy, I suddenly know. Merle isn't trying to fix our problems or change us. She is simply giving each of us her full attention instead of telling us what we should do. Mom doesn't do that. I don't think Adrian and Tony are capable of doing that. And as much as I hate to admit it, I don't do that either. I put my fork down and sit stock still as the hard truth hits full force. I've got as many oughts and shoulds and critiques as mom does. The only difference is she says hers out loud. Mine are silent, but just as deadly. Oh my God, I'm one of the demons I've been complaining about. I wonder what would happen if I listen really listen to mom's stories of stoic perseverance, to Adrian's poor me stories, or if I listen to Tony to hear his pain, maybe nothing, maybe everything, but it might be worth a try. I feel a rush of love for my slightly dysfunctional, but very normal family. It fills me up <clears throat> and tunes me in, at least for this moment. I give thanks for the insight. It seems an appropriate thing to do on this day. An hour later, amid hugs and goodbyes, Merle heads off to Cape Cod, leaving behind the scent of her perfume and seeds for healthy new growth in the bonds between my family and me. At six sharp, Clay arrives to rescue me, except I no longer feel the need to be rescued. He notices the smile on my face as we walk to the car. What's up, Cupcake? I tuck my arm through his as we walk. Clay, I say, hugging my new feelings close to my heart. Guess who came to dinner? So <clears throat> Thanksgiving is a couple weeks away. So when you either visit your family or friends or they come to visit you, really try to become really aware of the family or friend dynamics in whatever group you find yourself. <clears throat> try to name the dysfunctions yours it as well and how they might affect you and maybe your role in them so it's just kind of something to think about as that holiday comes up all righty <clears throat> so <clears throat> in the next story this is titled a stitch in time and so in this story, I weave together the lives of two women, Claudette 
is a figment of my imagination. Um, but Rebecca Primus was real and she lived in Hartford in the 1800s. And um, Trinity College has done an incredible amount of research on her life. So she's real. The Talcott Street Con Congregational Church, which is mentioned, the Reverend J.W. Pennington are all real people, documented local history. And in terms of the connections, Claudette is a friend to Clay, who's Lucille's son, and Clay's brother, Alan. And all three will come together in the last story. <clears throat> Claudette reached out a hand to flush the toilet as a familiar voice soared over the stall door. It was Carrie. <clears throat> when is Claudette going to stop moaning about her problems? I don't know how long I can be a guest at her pity party. Yeah, maybe we should nominate her for this month's PMS poster girl. The sound of their laughter shook Claudette to the core and registered a 9.9 .9 on her emotional Richter scale. Oh man, am I really that bad, she thought. Pity party? Well, let me take stock. Yes, I hate my job. Processing insurance applications is tedious, repetitive, and boring. A long, slow sigh escaped from two full lips. I'm black, female, close to 40, and single. I hate this city because there's nothing to do and there's no good men around. I hate the way I look and I'm not crazy about my family either. Shit, I am the PMS poster girl. So after work, <laughs> she raced home to her apartment and wrapped its warm comfort around her wounded soul. Feeling somewhat better after dinner, she moved to her bedroom and reached for the pile of fabric on the far side of the bed. Claudette had a deep and abiding passion for fabric and textiles. Once in a while, she dreamed of having her own brick and mortar store, but fear of failure and a sense of inadequacy kept her tied to her cubicle at work. Claudette reached for the remote and clicked on the TV sitting at eye level in the Oak Entertainment Center. Boring reality shows, chefs cooking, fake doctors saving fake lives, cops chasing crooks, soap operas dishing, news reporters reporting, political pundits punting, black woman smiling. Wait, what's this? It was the local public broadcasting channel. And the narrator was talking about the 19th century and the lives of free blacks. Pleased that she'd found a distraction with some relevance to her existence, Claudette picked up her needle and thread and began to work on her quilt. The smiling woman spoke. My name is Rebecca Primus. In 1867, I founded the first school for Africans in Royal Oak, Maryland. This is my story. Is that so, muttered Claudette. Talking back to the television was high on her list of solitary pleasures because a one-way conversation with no possibility of rebuttal made for therapeutic venting. I was born in 1836 in Hartford, Connecticut. Father was an officer in the Talcott Street Congregational Church. Mother sewed, had chickens, and had her own business training domestic workers. <clears throat> in 1849, father bought a home on Wadsworth Street in the white neighborhood, an astonishing achievement for a colored man at that time. Yes, yeah, said Claudette. Well, white neighborhoods aren't all they're cracked up to be, honey. I grew up as the only and the lonely, the grain of pepper in the salt, the raisin in the milk. The, well, well, you get the picture. Rebecca smiled. I went to the North African school at the Talcott Street Congregational Church. Reverend J.W. Pennington and his wife encouraged my natural bent for learning. So I determined to become a teacher. Claudette shifted her body to ease her legs. So, you had a dream. Well, la-dee-da, move over, Dr. King, and make way for Miss Thang. Hmm, bet you ended up cleaning pots in Miss Ann's kitchen, Rebecca said. When I turned 25, my dream came true. Well, said Claudette, how, pray tell, did you manage that, Missy? The Civil War was almost over. The white citizens of Hartford formed a Freedmen Society for the purpose of sending teachers south to help free slaves learn to read and write. 
I was one of five offered the position. And in November of 1864, I began the greatest adventure of my life. Whoa, says Claudette. You go, girl. Spread your nappy little wings and fly. Shoot, I can't even get my wings to flap. By December of 1865, I had a school in a church. Oh, what thrilling, rewarding work it was. And how wonderful to see the scales of ignorance fall away from the eyes of young and old alike. However, <clears throat> there, there was much sickness among the people, cholera, smallpox, typhoid, and measles, to name a few. And the Ku Klux Klan night raids, rallies, and cross burnings were quite terrifying. Yes, yeah, so how'd you keep your stuff together, Becky baby? Rebecca's eye <clears throat> eyes stared straight into Claudette's. Faith in God and a firm belief in my mission gave me the strength to persevere. Oh, you a churchified sister. Claudette rolled her eyes, but kept listening. And after two years, <clears throat> I determined to build my own school. In September of 1867, the great day dawned and the Primus Institute opened. What a glorious day. Truth be told, it was one of the most wonderful days of my life. The only sound coming from Claudette now was the soft swish of thread through fabric. Then disaster struck. Claudette looked up. Uh-huh. I knew it was too good to be true. Here comes some stuff. Reconstruction ended, and with the Freedmen's Bureau gone, the Hartford Society disbanded and called its teachers home. Colette put her needle down. <laughs> Your dream got deferred after all. Well, all my hopes and dreams were brutally crushed. The weight of it sent me to my knees. I felt my faith in God slipping. Finally, I accepted reality, closed the school, and boarded the train for home. Once settled back into family and church, I sought a teaching position in Hartford. But Connecticut had done away with separate schools, and the new integrated schools only hired white teachers. My teaching career was over. Claudette tisked and humphed. Rebecca smiled. But in order to make a useful living, I became a seamstress and worked with mother. Well, damn, girl, this ain't Miss Ann's kitchen, but it's close, a hundred and twenty-something years apart, and we're both stitching. <clears throat> you to make a living and me to keep from going postal. Hmm. As bad as things are, I can vote, own property, and get credit in my own name. And that's way more choice than you had, Rebecca. Claudette finished the last stitch in the tree branch on her quilt and made a decision. Carrie and Ginger are right. I need to change. Rebecca took a step forward. Death comes for us all. It came for me in 1932. Even though my dream ended too quickly, it did live. I was a teacher. I did help my people. We may experience success or failure, but we must try. It is, I think, what makes us truly human. Music swelled. <clears throat> Rebecca smiled. Credits rolled. Claudette yawned and stretched. Well, maybe I will do something about my business. Yeah, like Jackie Wilson said, a change gone come. First thing tomorrow, I'll start working up a business plan. But for now, I'll just sleep on it. Claudette's eyes closed, and soon she was fast asleep. Rebecca Primus folded her hands in front of her skirt. Her soft gaze came to rest on Claudette's sleeping figure. Good night, Claudette, said Rebecca as the screen slowly faded to black. So that last line, you can see there's a little bit of what <clears throat> they call magical realism to bring those two things together. But this was really fun to match a little bit of real history to a fictional character and sort of make them <clears throat> both um, live on the page. So that was a fun one to write. And... Okay, so in the next story, I think we'll have time for two more. <clears throat> so in the next story, um, it's about a, a psychiatrist, Dr. Franklin Rutledge. 
and he is thinking about Martha Ray Edmonds, a former client, as he prepares to deliver a lecture to college students majoring in psychology. In terms of the connections, you will, although she didn't have a name, um, Virginia's mother in the Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, her name is Martha Ray Edmonds, and she's the mother from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Dr. Rutledge is uh, is another story in Claudette's, she's also, Dr. Rutledge is also Claudette's therapist, and so we hear about that later on as well, so it, the connections are getting thicker. <clears throat> Life's a gift, baby. Wrap yourself well. This line from a commercial advertising fashion trends describes Mrs. Martha Ray Edmonds to a T. And it's the first line of my recent talk on the client-therapist relationship to a group of psychology majors. Mrs. Edmonds was 87 years old when I met her. She was widowed with three children, Virginia, Adrian, and Tony, and four grandchildren three living and one deceased. Mrs. Edmonds, <clears throat> what brings you to therapy? Well, Dr. Rutledge, I'm not a fan of talking about private matters to strangers, never have been, but I can't talk about my private matters with my children, especially with the way things are now. And what way is that? I asked softly. Well, I always wanted my children to be happy. So I did what mothers do. I pushed, prodded, suggested, and if I'm honest, criticized, I, I, she stopped and shook her head. And I urged, she looked at me and sighed. My son's life is a mess. I don't know how he pays the rent and keeps the lights on, but he's a good father and his boys seem happy. And your relationship with your daughters? Oh, until last year, pretty grim. One is divorced and remarried and the other is in an unhappy marriage to a totally unsuitable man. But after Thanksgiving last year, things started to change. In what way? Her eyes brightened. Well, <clears throat> Virginia and Adrian asked me to give them our family recipes. They said they would alternate family dinners between them to help out and give me a break. Frankly, I was relieved. Now, I've been thinking, and well, you, you see, my time, like yours and everyone else's, will run out. I do not want to meet my maker, dragging a passel of demons along with me. That's why I'm here. <clears throat> Honestly, the more I listened to her, the more she reminded me of myself. When I asked how she chose me to be her therapist, she gave me a mischievous smile. Six degrees of separation, Dr. Rutledge. You see, my daughter, Virginia, knows your former wife. She recommended you. Marceline. My heart shrinks a bit every time I think about my divorce, or rather her divorce, since she divorced me. As an unwilling ex-husband, I'm still struggling to come to grips with the sadness and sorrow I feel, even though I now understand her reasons for divorcing me. Like Mrs. Edmonds' expectations for her children, I had expectations for my marriage. I had tried to convince Marceline to be what I wanted her to be instead of accepting her for who she was. I pushed that memory aside. Although Mrs. Edmonds appeared strong and resilient, she was also vulnerable and had waited a long time to wrap herself in a life of her own making, largely because most of her early wrappings were made for her. She, like me, <clears throat> was born in the South and had dealt with all that meant for Black folks trying to make a way out of no way, as the saying goes. But underneath those outer wrappings, Martha Ray Edmonds did have demons. But until now, she had been reluctant to face them, trace them, or erase them. However, she was an expert in sniffing them out. She'd let them raise their eyes from her subconscious mind, and then she would smash the lid of defiance, dismissal, and denial on top of their heads. Did that work in the long term? Sadly, no, because her wrappings had started to come apart at the seams and experienced more than a few rips and frayed edges as the demons boldly peeked out over the brave toss of her head, the flick of her hand, and the smile on lips that never quite reached her eyes. But as she began to trust me, she allowed the demons to tiptoe up and out. Her lips would tighten as she expressed anger at the father who'd left. 
She shared her sadness at losing her mother and her fear at leaving the South and moving North to live with an aunt and uncle she hardly knew. She teared up about the grief she experienced when her grandchild, Tony's daughter, Tamisha, died at the age of eight. My job as her therapist was to create a safe space, listen to her pain, and respond with empathy and warmth to let her know I understood what she was feeling. It wasn't hard because our shared background and the need to be in control as a defense mechanism against vulnerability gave the two of us solid connection points that transcended gender and age. I listened and passed the box of tissues when they were needed. When the last demon was outed, she paused, looked at me, cocked her head to one side, and said, not a pretty picture, is it? She may have seen herself that way, but what I saw was the gift of a woman who faced her demons, a woman newly wrapped in honesty, strength, and resilience. One crisp fall day several months later, Mrs. Edmonds walked through my office door, took her place on the couch, folded her hands in her lap, and said, Dr. Rutledge, I want to thank you for your help, but the time has come to terminate our sessions. Are you sure? Yes, she replied with a nod of her head. I followed the next question by protocol. Well, have your goals been met or is there another reason you can share with me? Well, Dr. Rutledge, if all my goals were met, my son would hold down a good job and stop pestering the family to invest in his schemes. Virginia would call me more than once a week and Adrian would find a way to make her marriage work. None of those things happened. But I've forgiven my father for abandoning me. I've made peace with losing my mother, my husband, and Tamisha. I have a more accepting and realistic view of my childhood with my aunt and uncle. They did their best, and I've done mine. Her face softened. I'm in a place where I can move forward with a bit more ease. I've learned that nothing is perfect. She grinned. Not even me. I never thought I'd be able to do this kind of work, but I did. Thank you, Dr. Rutledge. And so we parted. Nine months after our sessions ended, Virginia called to tell me that her mother had passed away in her sleep. I was saddened to learn of her passing, but confident that Mrs. Martha Ray Edmonds met her maker with a calm heart, clear mind, and a clean slate. I still think of her fondly, and her well-wrapped life continues to inspire mine." So this was interesting to write because I find that I I can also write from a male point of view. And so to also put this in the first person voice instead of the third person voice was an interesting challenge because I like to mix things up. Um, I think we have chant time for one more story. So I'm going to read the last one where some of the characters come together. <clears throat> this is top titled A Party for Alan. And it basically works with that whole phrase, six degrees of separation. Um, so you'll notice that in this story is told in the voices of several of the characters that we've met before, Clay, Lucille Jenkins' son, Lucille Jenkins, um, Claudette, Dr. Rutledge, and Alan, who is Clay's brother, because Lucille Jenkins has two boys. Okay, <clears throat> so we start with Clay. Alan is dying. It's kidney failure. Grandma, dad, Uncle Henry, and four cousins have transitioned off the planet because of this disease. Now it's my brother's turn because this last kidney is failing and his doctors have given him three to six months. So Alan and Harrison decided to plan a celebration of life while he's still here and they can both enjoy it. And when they sat me down to break the news, I was devastated, but mom's here. She took the train up from Virginia. We told her to stay home, but she is one stubborn lady. Next voice we hear, Lucille Jenkins. Stay home and take it easy. Hm. I may be old, but I'm still breathing and on the right side of the ground. People telling me I can't or shouldn't do something ain't never stopped me when my mind was made up. Today, I'm gonna celebrate. I'll mourn later in private. Then I'll reach out and touch his picture and whisper, farewell, Alan, goodbye. But not now, not today, because we've got crispy fried chicken and smoked ham for the meat eaters. There's Hoppin' John for the vegetarians. 
the side dishes are looking good. And my nutmeg glazed gingerbread from Ancestor Rebecca's book, The Art of Nutmeg Cookery is there as a dessert. And I'm lucky to be celebrating Alan's life with the family tonight. When he told me he liked boys, I didn't understand. We didn't have words like gay and coming out back then. Left me flat out dumbfounded with no words, excepting to tell him I loved him no matter what. He went north after high school and the fear sitting on my heart for him lifted. He was a good boy. Now he's a good man. I still can't quite wrap my head around a man marrying a man, but Harrison's a sweet soul and they done made a good life together. The next voice we hear is Claudette. <clears throat> Alan has a talent for taking in strays and treating them like family. And I'm one of those strays. After I quit my job and started my business, I was living on canned tuna fish until I met Alan at a Chamber of Commerce networking event. And he asked me to plan his wedding. Now I'm going to miss him when he leaves us. But right now, I need to make sure this celebration goes off without a hitch. Ms. Jenkins gives me a big smile to let me know she's satisfied with the food before going off to join her family in the green room. Everyone else is there, Alan and Harrison, Alan's brother, Clay, Clay's wife, Virginia, their son, Scott, Scott's wife, Maya, and their daughter, Sarah. Last but not least are Harrison's parents. I give the band a nod. It's go time. Now we hear from Alan. <clears throat> Harrison looks sad. I know he's thinking about life without me. I wish it were the other way around, but there's nothing to be done. It's ironic. Ever since our ancestors arrived in this country, we've survived enslavement, Jim Crow, poverty, segregation, and the culture shock of living with the North subtle racism, but there's no running away from this disease. Now, when I knew that he and I would have a future together, I introduced him to Clay and took him to meet mom. That went pretty well. But Harrison's parents was another matter because he had not come out to them. So to tell him, tell them that he was gay and then bring his black boyfriend home to meet them at the same time would have been more than either of us was ready for. So he did it in stages. He was expecting shock and disapproval. What he got was anything but. And it threw him for a loop. Not only were they absolutely fine with it, they seemed relieved. Same response when they met me. Both of us were puzzled until we saw the DNA results that Harrison got from the kit I gave him for our wedding anniversary. Now we hear from Clay again. Made no never mind to me that Alan was with a white man. I thought maybe mom would have some reservations, but she dealt with Alan being gay pretty well. So I figured she'd get used to Harrison being white. She took it in stride. We all breathed a sigh of relief, figuring this would be the last of any family surprises. Well, that held true till Alan gave Harrison a DNA kit for their first wedding anniversary. See, Harrison was adopted and his mom and dad never told him anything about his biological parents. He grew up as a white boy until the results came back. Turns out he's 51% Sub-Saharan African, 46% European, and 3% Native American. Talk about finding your roots. Now, Harrison needed to know if his parents knew he was mixed race and didn't tell him, or if they didn't know, how would they feel about him when they knew? Virginia suggested they go see Doc Rutledge. They did. Turns out Harrison's parents did know and didn't tell him because they thought he'd have an easier life as a white man. And when Harrison told them he was gay, they were okay with it because their only worry had been the possibility that Harrison might produce a black grandchild when he got married. Needless to say, those issues kept them in Rutledge's office for several sessions. Now, Alan is and always has been the center of attention with his classy, intelligent, kind vibe. Being confined to a wheelchair doesn't hold him back. He looks dapper and fashionable, but it's clear he's fading away from us. I'm going to miss him something terrible, but right now I need to be upbeat for Claudette to let us know when it's time to make our family entrance. And then at the last, we hear from Alan again. I've made my peace with death. First, I researched the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I went to Doc Rutledge to work through the first four. 
For acceptance, I hired a lawyer to write a will and manage my last request. I have no regrets except for the fact that I'm going to have to do my dancing in this wheelchair, but I still have some moves left. My phone pings. It's Claudette's text. I reach out and ask Sarah, my grandchild, to hold my hand. She puts her left hand in mine, clutches her Uhura doll with her right, looks up at me with those big brown eyes and says, Uncle Alan, when I'm big and fly my spaceship to the stars, can you come with me? I lean in close and squeeze her hand and tell her, yes, baby girl, I can come with you. I've already made plans. He's going to give his brother uh, a vial of his ashes for Sarah to take into space. And I'm working on a science fiction novel where that actually happens. <laughs> My family gathers around me. Harrison kisses the top of my head. I smile. It's on. Let's get my party started. So that's how the book ends. And um, just for something for you all to think about, it's never too early to think about how you'd like your family and friends to celebrate your life. So that's something to, to, to think about. And um, I don't know if there are any questions 